It's my pleasure to introduce Kari Karuzzi, who is a researcher at uh, Aalborg University in Denmark, currently spending a year in the math department at Stanford University. A person wrote to me a few weeks back and asked if I'd like her to, to come and give a talk on the time reversal. And I wrote, wrote back, asked her to tell me if time reversal meant that I could be young again. <laughs> and uh, when she answered no, I, I wrote back and said, never mind, we're not interested. <laughs> but then she told me more about it. And it sounded very interesting, so I invited her to come and give us a talk. You're so welcome to Linda. Thank you very much, Laya, and thank you everybody for having me here today. I will uh, talk to you about time reversal, which uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very hot topic. It's certainly new when we uh, put it in the framework of wireless communications and. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that it's going to solve every, every problem, but it solves some problems and it does it in a very technical way. So, um, as Larry said, I'm right now at the math department at Stanford, who are working with George Tov and Palau, who have been active in time reversal, mainly in the context of imaging. Um, so, feel free to contact me at this email address uh, if you want to. Um, Although University is my more permanent affiliation. So today, I will give you some motivation why you might want to do time reversal, and then I'll go through the theory behind it and the notation that I will be using throughout the talk. Uh, then I will uh, talk to you about measurements, the that is Ms. Kalibola there, um, because uh, I'm trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of this technique based on fixed wireless access measurements. Um, and I will talk to you about the equipment and the methods uh, used. Then I will show you the results in terms of uh, time compression and spatial focusing, the temporary coherence of the method, and the capacity and rate that can be achieved. And then I will conclude. So uh, I'm sure you have seen slides like this already. We need to get a higher rate, so we tend to go into larger bandwidths. In that case, the delay spread of the channel becomes a problem. And uh, so here I have uh, some uh, environments, indoor and outdoor, and some typical values of the delay spread that uh, have been measured. And then here I have the bandwidth of uh, wireless LAN and uh, third generation systems. As you can tell, the, the the symbol time, which is the inverse of the bandwidth traffic, um, is much less than the delay spread. So we have a problem. And how do we solve that? Well, several solutions have been uh, proposed. OFPM is one, equalization is another. We can uh, use uh, uh, codes. The problem with all these solutions is that you need a more complicated receiver. And uh, that means that your receiver is uh, more expensive. And that means that uh, if you're Nokia, uh, you don't want to do that because nobody's going to buy your handset. They're going to buy some other handset that's cheaper. So I would like to have a single receiver. I would like to have narrow. Uh, I would like to have a narrow band channel, a channel with a small delay spread. So. Um, there are, and then, you know, you have been hearing a lot about multiple antenna systems, MIMO. Um, the problem there is also the cost of the receiver. So if you have a lot of antennas on your mobile station, so on your terminal device, this device becomes expensive. Uh, if you have them at uh, the base station, then, okay, you pay a price in equipment, on renting the site, uh, supplying it with power, or for the complex, complexity. But uh, this cost is absorbed by the service provider. And if, if you can somehow, as a service provider, accommodate more users in a uh, per area, then the cost per user is lower. So with that in mind, I'm going to try and work with a system that has a lot of antennas at the base station, if that's going to help, at a very simple receiver at the mobile station. So now we move on to the theory annotation. I'm sure you have seen pictures like this before. 
on uh, your left hand side, there's a transmitter. And it sends a signal to X of P, that's uh, basically um, this bit, XK, by, uh, by shifted um, policies. Y is my bus uh, shaping function. This signal is transmitted through, from my antenna, it travels through my wide band channel H of P. And then oh, when it is received, there's some noise in it that we added due to hardware imperfections. And Y of T is my resultant received signal. Now this equation is uh, what relates all the quantities mm -hmm. in the board. And the uh, symbol here stands for, uh, stands for convolution, right? So nothing new so far. And this is not new either. What happens usually is that people go out and measure the channel here, they get one realization of the channel transfer of function H, they measure the channel here, they get another realization of H, they measure the channel here, another realization of H. So they average over these results over the local area, and they get what we call the power delay profile. And uh, from that, uh, you can uh, calculate the delay spread of the channel as the second moment of the power delay profile. So this is the quantity that we would like to minimize. And um, this is a uh, rough picture of what uh, we're going to do. We're going to use this filter as the transmitter, the filter uh, G, before we send the, sig the signal out. So the same uh, X of T is going to go through all these filters before it gets transmitted. And what time reversal fundamentally says is that these filters have a specific form. They are scaled versions of the phase conjugated and time reversed uh, channel impulse response from this particular transmitter to our intended receiver. Right? So if we follow one path, we can see that X of T is going to go through G1 of T convolved, is going to convolve with G1 of T convolved with H1 of T. So this means, given the specific form of uh, G1 of T, that it will see on this path a scaled version of the autocorrelation of uh, H1 of T. Now, because I'm doing it from multiple antennas, uh, we have a scaled sum of all these autocorrelations. Now, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to look at the delay spread of this equivalent channel mm -hmm. impulse response. And I'm going to see how it behaves relative to the um, delay spread of the impulse <coughs> response H. Okay? Now, how do I choose the scaling factors, AF? Well, fundamentally, I have a constraint that says I cannot be transmitting more power now than I was before. So no matter what, the, these uh, filters that I introduce have to have a gain of one. And if I normalize all of them by the same factor, I have what I call pure type reversal. And in that case, all the gain factors are equal, and they're given by this equation here. But uh, you might have a different power constraint. You might uh, be limited by your hardware, and your, trans your each antenna cannot transmit more than a specific amount of power. In that case, you have to normalize per transmitter. And this is what I call equal power allocation. And in that case, the scaling factors are given by this equation here. So they are different from transmitter to transmitter. And then, if you want to minimize the delay spread, there is a way to optimally choose the scaling factors. And I will show you how to do that on the next slide. So um, I think that this is the last map you are going to see. So bear with me. We make a vector A that contains all the scaling factors. Then for each one of the channel impulse responses, of which we had, say, an S sample, we make a vector, A on M, of the autocorrelation. 
So if they originally uh, primary impulse response had uh, NS samples, the autocorrelation has left two NS minus one samples. And it goes uh, from minus NS minus one PS to NS minus one PS. So <coughs> I've made this vector for each one of the channel impulse responses, and then I stack those vectors together, and I get this uh, matrix R. Now, the equivalent channel impulse response can be written as a product of these two matrices. Okay? Now, I want to minimize the delay spread of this one. The function with the lowest delay spread is the delta function. So, I would like this to be as close as possible to the delta function. Is that all? Well, no, because then in that case we would be solving a very simple uh, equation. But if you think about it, uh, in the calculation of the delay spread, the, the errors that you make, the deviations that you make from the delta function far away from zero are more important than the errors that you make close to zero. So what we have is essentially a scale optimization problem, and this is what we're going to solve. And this is what this matrix T does. T is the diagonal matrix, and along the main diagonal, it has these values of time. So it starts from minus NS minus 1, and it goes all the way to NS minus 1. Now, in the middle, it has a 0. And if you we were trying to solve this problem, you wouldn't be able to do it. MATLAB would crash. So you would have to introduce this little epsilon identity matrix there, and that makes the problem uh, better posed. And uh, you solve it, you find the vector of optimal weight, and then you normalize them so that you have uh, power one. So, so what is the, what's the problem with um, then, no matter what, no matter what the A's are, the resulting the, uh, vector would have a zero in the middle. But we want it to have one in the middle. We want it to be oh. equal to delta. So that's that's why you need to introduce this. Okay. So let's see how well this performs. I will talk to you about the measurements first. So, so I just got to the, mm -hmm. the uh, can you go back to this point? I just like, didn't really understand like what the the metric is for. Like, and you said I want to optimize the delay spread. I want right? to and delay spread. Delay. I guess it's represented by your your R matrix, right? Um, Somehow. Sort of. I mean, I'm just so, um, I've, made, I've made use of a couple of other factors that I didn't talk about here. Yeah. Um, so, the delay spread, um, what you have to do is take H, K, uh, absolute square. Yeah. Right? Sure. And then you have to multiply it by k squared, basically. And then you have to take the sum over all the k's, right? From minus n s1 minus 1 to n s minus 1. But um, you haven't uh, subtracted the, uh, the mean yeah. from this equation. So you have to take out the mean, uh, and then all that you have the total power. Okay. The mean or the mean and the square of the mean. Well, the mean square of the mean. Yeah. But uh, because the autocorrelations are symmetric, and uh, no matter what the the mean is going to be zero, I can take this out. Right. So I'm, I'm left with minimizing this quantity. Now, this. So those, that, those H's, though, are the, uh, the real channel H's involved. Like, so that's some kind uh, of. The, well, that's actually the H equivalent. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now, 
uh, we want to minimize this thing. To do that, you can do, you can write it as T, this diagonal matrix I was uh, talking about, times H equivalent as a vector. And um, so now it is a vector, and I have to take the absolute value of that uh, square. Well, um, that basically says that H equivalent should lie on the uh, on the eigenvectors of this matrix that has the lowest eigenvalue. But this is exactly the because this matrix is like that and zero is here, it would be this vector here. Okay? But I, I can't do that exactly because this is zero in the middle. So I have to add this epsilon i. And that's, that's what I do, and that's how I end up with that. So physically, though, what you're really going to choose is the D, right? Like no. The, the I'm A's? I'm going to oh, choose okay, so the G's are the time reversal, yeah. and the mm -hmm. A's are the time. Okay. Then there is, of course, a generalized time reversal. When you, you allow yourself more freedom in choosing the G's, uh, and then, for example, you might uh, impose that the, B, the G is just a function so that at the sampling instances it's zero, but I'm not going to impose anything for its form in between. But that's uh, a separate problem that I'm not going to look at because it requires more complicated processing. So I'm just going to stick with the G being at the time reverse version of the channel. Okay? So I just have a uh -huh. simple question. So using these time reversal fields and, and organizing them in this way, then you can find the delay spread using this form. Mm -hmm. so, so is that why we use uh, time reversal fields in the first place? Um, I use time reversal in the hope <coughs> of reducing the delay spread. Right. Uh, and uh, I use the scaling factors to get the minimum de delay spread that I could possibly achieve. I guess this is related to why, I mean, you could imagine other filters, some other combinations, which can also tell you the delay spread. Yeah, it's like, I can, I can, if you are allowed for generalized time reversal, you can build the filters G any way you like. So if you somehow have to say a, a one antenna channel, mm -hmm. right, the, the, the using the sort of G that the time reversal, like you increase the delay spread, don't you? Just because you're evolving, um, is that true or not? Um, I will get to that. that. The answer is depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me tell you about the measurements. So, this measurement was taken at uh, 5 GHz with uh, a bandwidth of 20 MHz. Uh, the transmitted power was uh, 100 milliwatts and the antennas had a 3 dB bandwidth of uh, um, the filters had a 3 dB bandwidth of 25 MHz. Uh, the, uh, the measurements were MIO measurements that were taken with 8 elements uniform linear arrays on both ends. Adjacent elements were separated by a half wavelength, so that's about 3 centimeters, and uh, each element was vertically polarized. And to take the measurements, the arrays were, were either vertically or horizontally oriented. And that's at both ends. That gives you four computations. So they were like that, like that, like that, like that. Four? So four. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, um, when the measurements were taken, uh, they were taken simultaneously from all transmitter antennas. And uh, this is achieved by a method that separates the transmitted signals in the code domain. So each antenna is the same long sequence, but they're just offset by a little bit from antenna to antenna. And uh, the sequences were specifically chosen to have good autocorrelation properties. The time resolution was 12.5 nanoseconds, which means that we have a factor of 4 oversampling in the measurements. And 
taking one measurement of the channel and then recording it to hard disk uh, is, uh, takes 26 milliseconds. This is one record of the channel. But for each configuration, we took 512 records. And uh, why we did that? Because it, on the short term, it gives you a sense of how much the channel has changed over those 512 records. Now, the measurements were taken in downtown Toronto, and I'm going to talk about uh, three links uh, that uh, were in these three buildings here. Location A is the Four Seasons Hotel, it's a very tall building, and uh, the measurements were taken from the 5th, the 19th, and the 28th floor. Location B is the retention building, and uh, locations were taken from the 19th floor and from the rooftop, the 29th floor. And location C is uh, the Department of Chemistry at the University of Toronto and measurements were taken from the roof. As you can see, these three links differ in length. So we go from 1.2 kilometers to 2 kilometers to 2.6 kilometers. But they also differ in the relative uh, clutter around the transmitter and the receiver. So for example, around this area, there are tall buildings that are obstruction close to location A. And this is an effect that we're going to use later. Now I will uh, show you how well we did in terms of time compression with those three power allocation schemes that I, I described before. Um, the blue curve here shows like uh, um, one uh, uh, record of the channel, so from one transmitter to one receiver. This is roughly what it looks like. Uh, why does it trigger so much? Well, this is noise, and we have to uh, keep it. We do that. We can get an estimate of uh, the noise. I won't go into how we do that. Uh, and we keep at twice the noise bias. So if we assume Gaussian noise, this means that about 90% of our noise samples have been suppressed. And um, we still have some peaks that we are probably noise, but they're letting. Um, but we hope we have suppressed most of the noise. So we can do time reversal on the red curve, whatever is left above twice the noise bias. Now, if I do time reversal on this uh, realization of the channel impulse response, I get a, a figure like this one. Um, and I've plotted it on the same time scale to illustrate that before, if you just eyeball it, the delay spread is what? About one microsecond, right? Now, when you go to the autocorrelation, you haven't improved things m uh, much. It's still about uh, one microsecond. What has changed though was is the peak. So before, oops, the peak was um, less than 110 on this scale, and now it's, uh, it's more than 100, 110. So we have gained a bit in power, despite the fact that we're still sending the same transmit power, we just have concentrated more on the main peak. Now, <coughs> if you do this, from several antennas, we get a lot of curves like that. And they're just curves in different colors on this plot. What happens? All these plots are coherently in the center and incoherently on the side. So the side lobes go down and the main lobe goes up. And you end up with a curve like that. It's a thick red line. What properties does it have that can help us? Well, it has a lower delay spread, it is symmetrical, and that helps in vision an equalizer, and has a higher peak in the middle. And these are the properties that we're going to um, use in uh, our receiver. Now, uh, the question that you asked before, have you made things better or worse? Um, mm -hmm. I know this is done, but I assume this is a DB scale? Uh, it's not exactly TV. We have to account for um, the, uh, the amplification introduced in the receiver. So I, you know, you add some number and then translates into TBM. Okay. I'm, regardless of the translation, the relative scale is decimal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I want to say is the following: if we have had an ultra wide sun channel, even 
the, the CISO and reversal would give you a very narrow pulse. But with, these measurements were taken with 20 megahertz, so it's not very wide band. And um, that's why you don't get much by CISO time reversal. But alpha wide band would have done the trick for you. That's why we, we use more antennas to make up for this loss. Um, as a rule of thumb, uh, what we say is that time reversal can work when the bandwidth, the laser product, is uh, more than 20. And this is exactly the, the lower limit for the white mass. We have a delay spread of about 1 microsecond bandwidth of 20 megahertz, so we have the laser product of 20 megahertz. Okay, so that's the first Here's what happens to the delay spread when I use pure time reversal. I have grouped the measurements in the following way. If my uh, transmitter is in the clear situation, uh, if the, it's in a clear environment, then uh, I can do time reversal from this clear location, from whatever eight antennas were in this clear, to my receiver that is somewhere in the clutter, and I call this clear to clutter first. Equivalently, I can do time reversal in the, from the clutter situation to the clear. And uh, because the channel is uh, reciprocal, I can use the same, uh, and the measurements were minimal measurements. I can do this in both directions for, each, for any location. <coughs> okay. This is the, the this is for a single antenna? This is a eight to one meso time reversal. Okay. So <laughs> what you can see is that with pure time reversal you get a delay spread reduction by a factor of two. So we're down to uh, two point five. And uh, what also happens is, is that it how much better you do depends on uh, the scattering situation around your transmitters and around your receiver. So when we do time reversal from the cluttered to the clear, uh, things improve and you increase the separation between the transmitter and the receiver. The opposite happens when you do time reversal from the clear to the cluttered. Now, what happens when I use um, equal power allocation. Well, it turns out that you do worse. You cannot reduce your delay spread so effectively. It's not not much worse than a factor of two, but it's uh, it's worse because it's a, it's a serious system, it's a more limited system. Now, when you use the optimal power allocation that we thought of before, you, you see that not only do you get the same performance for both the clutter to clear and clear to clutter situation, but you have a delay spread reduction of more than a factor of three. So that's good. So optimal uh, power allocation um, actually helps you in reducing the delay spread. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to talk to you now about uh, station faults. So before we were targeting a specific receiver, now I'm going to look at, <coughs> at how much signal I get at an adjacent receiver close to my target. And I will take like this. I will just rewrite the equations. And we said before that the equivalent channel impulse response to the target is the scale sum of the autocorrelation of the individual channel impulse responses. Now, if I look at an off-target location, Instead of the autocorrelations, I get the cross correlations. And what um, there are different ways you can uh, look at the interference. One of them is that you can integrate the power of target and compare it to the integrated power on the target. So this is this equation here. Alternatively, you can look at the peak of the power of target and uh, on the target. And um, I'm going to use this metric for the results that I'm going to show later because uh, this is a result that has been uh, theoretically analyzed and there are some nice expressions for it. Now, <coughs> this is kind of what I'm going to do. Say I express the interference relative to my target for the various 
and Tena separations, for the various uh, separations between my target and the off-target locations. And I get the blue curve. I'm going to... So if I take, for example, this one, it is averaged over all combinations of target and off-target that are separated by half the wavelength. Well, in my 8x8 array, I have a lot of these pairs. But uh, when I start looking at greater separations, I don't have so many pairs to average over. And because of that, I'm going to neglect these points because I think that I don't have enough statistics. So I'm going to look at, because of, at separations up to 2.5 um, wavelengths. And uh, I'm going to try and fit a Gaussian curve to this one, because that's what I expect the power to follow us. And I uh, will get an expression like that, and I'm going to use the variance of my uh, Gaussian as a measure of how good the special focus is. So uh, the variance is exactly the distance at which the power would fall to one of the leads, the power on the target. Uh, if you want to set a different threshold, you can do that. Say you want minus 10 dB, it would be 1.52 times um, the variance. Now, if we want good spatial focusing, we want this uh, Gaussian curve to be as uh, narrow as possible. So <coughs> we want D to be small. Now, let's see how it behaves. Behave. <coughs> when you do time reversal from the cluttered to the clear, using pure time reversal, you just look at the red stars and uh, you get uh, a, a D of about two to three wavelengths. Now, when you do the optimal weighting, you do worse than that. The, the, the blue circles are above uh, the red the stars. Now, <coughs> what are these? The purple crosses are for equal power location. And here, they, they appear to be zero. Then you would think, wow, that's great. I mean, that's the narrowest uh, I can think of. But well, actually, no, this is just a trick I used to indicate the cases where the interference was going actually up when uh, uh, my calculations gave me an imaginary uh, sigma. So <coughs> equal power is not good. Why? Because it, may, it gives you greater interference than it actually gives you sigma. And uh, similar things can be observed if you look at the clear to cluttered case. So <coughs> uh, what you take out from this discussion is that optimal weights were, optima were optimal when we were looking at minimizing the delay effect. But when we look at spatial focusing, they're not all optimal at all. And uh, pure time reversal turns out to be a good compromise between the two objectives. Uh, temporal focusing and spatial focusing. So why do you have two results for each uh, distance? Uh, because I have two measurement sets. Uh, same parameters in each measurement? Or? Um, there were probably different floors. Oh, okay. But, uh, uh, still, um, the same polarization orientations. Um, all these results are, I forgot to say that, are for the horizontal to horizontal orientation because it turns out that gives you the greatest reduction in the light but I'm uh, not going to talk about it. It just has, it's something that you see in MIMO too. It makes more sense to put your antennas in the direction where your channel is more interesting, and the channel is more interesting in the azimuth plane. <coughs> and um, it's clear to clutter, and clutter to clear is always relative. So now, I'm going to talk about uh, the temporal coherence of the channel. So what happens when the cha channel has changed from when you actually measured it uh, to when you are actually doing time reversal. So <coughs> this is what we had ideally before. The equivalent channel inverse response was a state sum of the, um, of the convolution of the original channel inverse response with uh, itself 
time uh, reverse. Well, <coughs> what happens actually is that you periodically estimate age, and then you use this estimate to do time reversal for a period of time that I call T feedback here. And it turns out, and then you estimate it again, and you use a new estimate for a little while, and so on and so forth. And what happens is that the equivalent channel impulse response is now the result of the convolution of the actual channel with what it was when you measured it. And I'm going to see how much worse we're doing in terms of delays. There. there are different ways to look at the temporal stability. You can do it for each link individually. And uh, we have done that. And it turns out that uh, the coherence time of the links uh, is 150 to 415 milliseconds, depending on which link you are discussing. However, what we are trying to do now is mesotime reversal, so we are interested in the joint variation of the links. And to do that, I'm going to just try time reversal, calculate the delay spread, and um, see how much worse it is. And <coughs> as I said before, I will look only at pure time reversal. Why? Because it's uh, simple, it is efficient, it, and um, it is a good compromise between my spatial and temporary focusing objectives. So the characteristics that we had before and we said are useful for us were that we had a lower delay spread, we had a symmetrical response, and we had higher peak in the middle. Right now, we most definitely do not have a symmetrical impulse response. But we can look at what happens to the delay spread and the peak. Now, um, if you look at the delay spread, uh, you expect things to be worse than before. So you expect to have a higher delay spread. And indeed, originally we had the blue curve, and now we have pink, the green, the red, the purple, and the black curve that go above it. So we have lost something in terms of the age, but um, it's uh, not much. And um, it turns out that uh, I have tried this for, uh, for feedback delays of 26 milliseconds, 500, roughly 500 milliseconds and roughly uh, 1,000 milliseconds, so one second. So <coughs> uh, for 500 and 1,000, it's about the same result. So that's kind of the limit of uh, how frequently you should uh, go back and train. Now, <laughs> if you look at uh, how much the peak has changed, uh, you expect this to be lower than before. And indeed, uh, we are below the blue curve that we had before. How much do we lose? Uh, about 3 dB, right? So, the difference between these two curves is about uh, um, 3 dB. And the same conclusions as uh, before hold. So, uh, what does this tell us? It tells us that we have to train the channel frequently, even in this scenario that we are discussing, which is a fixed wireless access problem. And how often do we have to train? Well, every one second, uh, but worst case. Now, the curve that I showed before uh, was for the peak power. What we frequently care about is the total power. And um, if uh, you look at that and compare it to the one-to-one -one case, then <coughs> you see that um, you ideally you would get a gain of about uh, 15 dB, and now you lose about 2. Uh, when you do the, the delay uh, feedback. And um, why is this important? It is important because integrated power is easier to translate into rate. So this brings us to the third uh, topic that we're going to talk about for the results. So the discussion on capacity and rate. So if you translate the previous signal to noise ratios into rate, you would uh, see a curve like that. You would gain about 5 
fix for a second for her um, if uh, you should miss all time to do so. And that's kind of like the diversity gain that you would gain from eight uh, antennas. Um, but I have a problem with capacity. Um, it's too ideal a measure. I would rather be talking about rates because they're more realistic. And uh, so I'm going to talk about performance. I'm going to assume that I have a certain receiver, a receiver with uh, given capabilities. I'm going to assume that I have a minimum mean square receiver that uh, has uh, 10 tabs and it uses the fact that uh, the measurements were taken with the full time over sampling. And I'm going to try and look how much better I do <coughs> in terms of time reversal. Do you mean a, a, a T over 4 spaced equalizer when you say 4? Yeah. yeah. Why T over 4 instead of T over 2? Well, my measurements were T over 4, so oh. I decided to use that. But I'm going to use the same receiver for both TR and uh, non TR. So these are uh, the channels that I had before. Uh, this is the, the one to one channel. And on this one to one channel, I'm going to put all my power onto this antenna. And say that uh, I send enough power to achieve a match spectral bound signal to noise ratio of 60 dB. My, my equalizer, my MMC equalizer with uh, the 10 tabs gives me an unbiased signal to noise ratio of 3 dB. Now, if I were targeting a probability of error of 10 to the minus 3, I cannot do it in that human body. This, this results are positive by uh, simple by simple detection. You're saying the match filter bound is 60 dB and the MMC is using yeah. 19 dB? Yeah, because I have a lot of tabs. Yeah. And I cannot uh, recover them with my ten thousand that same color to have. Now <coughs> if I do feature time reversal, so I I only use again one pair of antennas and I use a time reversal filter on the transmitter side and I send all my power on this one link. I can improve the match filter bound and uh, my the same uh, equalizer, well, an equalizer with the same capability, uh, can give me a non bias signal to noise ratio that is higher than before, and I get some performance from my target probability of error. Now, if I do mission time reversal, uh, I get a much higher non bias signal to noise ratio to the output of my equalizer, and I do much better in terms of rate. Um, the perverse here is because I'm assuming that uh, I don't have any kind of fancy pulse uh, shape, I'm just assuming square pulse. Now, um, these results. Can, can you clarify the same question you already asked? I'm sorry, I just yeah. this. What's the difference between the 60 dB and the 3 dB? Is that relative? Or? Um, this is a much bigger bound, so the integrated power. And this is the output, of, uh, the signal to noise ratio as the output of the MMC equalizer. Did you say what is U stands for? Unbiased. Okay. Um, and um, I want to clarify something. Uh, these results are assuming that I'm running my system at full rate. Uh, there are other things you can do, but I'm not going to discuss today. So you can give up some of your rate, but then you, uh, so instead of sending uh, signals every so much, you can spread them farther apart, and that reduces your intersymbol interference, and you can do better in terms of rate. But throughout this uh, part of the talk, I'm going to assume that I'm running the system at full rate. But that's an interesting question though, right? If mm -hmm. you reduce the symbol rate but increase the constellation, yeah. you may find a better trade-off yeah. than, than the yeah. results you get. It, uh, I haven't done that yet. Okay. Um, so, now, there are different ways you can measure how much things have improved. 
so what are your parameters that you can write? But you can write the modulation, you can write the transit power, you can write the target speed error rate, or you can write the number of tabs in the equalizer. Independently of, um, you can keep three of these parameters the same and write the other ones and you get a gain. So for example, if you keep the transit power constant, the bit error rate, uh, the target bit error rate is the same and the number of tabs the same, so the complexity of your receiver is the same, you vary the modulation and you can achieve a higher rate with uh, time reversal. Um, it depends on how you want to look at it. Uh, I have colleagues that would naturally go for the last option. They would say, no, I want to keep my modulation the same, my probability, my transmit power the same, and my feed error rate the same, but I want to see how much less transmit power I, I can afford to transmit by using um, trend reversal. And that's another valid way to do it. But I'm going to concentrate on the rate. And um, I'm going to set my error rate to 2 to the minus 3, and I'm going to set my number of tasks to 10. So, um, when you do that, you get a curve like that, and I will, I will guide you through it um, so that you don't want to get lost. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that these results are just one. Uh, realization of the channel per record. So I haven't done the full processing to get the average behavior. So possibly three months from now we we'll have different curves. But uh, I will just show you what this one realization says. So here's what it says. If I use, uh, if I don't use time reversal, but I put all my power on the on one of the 64 possible links, because I have 8 uh, by 8, then on average I will be getting the uh, blue stars uh, in terms of rate. And you can see that there is somewhere down here with, uh, uh, with, an, uh, with an equalizer of this capability. Now, if I use uh, uh, time reversal on these one-to-one -one links, uh, what good properties of time reversal have I kept? Well, I have intensity a little bit, and I have also uh, uh, a symmetric response now. Hyperlogic can make use of this. And uh, then I get the red stars that are slightly above uh, the blue stars. Now, if I do time reversal, no matter which way I do it, from the cutter to the clear, from the clear to the cutter, you can see that I go way above, and uh, I have um, increased my, my rate by a factor of five, four, um, maybe seven in this case. Either. So this is what happens. It turns out that the story changes a little bit if you increase the capabilities of your equalizer. So over here, I'm assuming an equalizer with 20 tabs, and you can see that the improvement is not uh, so dramatic anymore. Why? Because the equalizer is already capable enough of handling the delay spread of uh, the original channel. So what did we see today? Uh, we, we saw that when we use time reversal, we can reduce the delay spread of the channel. Moreover, we induce a symmetric response that we can explode, uh, explode in our equalization, and we have a higher peak in the center. The delay spread uh, can be reduced by up to a factor of three if we do uh, optimal weighting of our uh, transmitters. And uh, the performance, so the benefit that we gain, depends on the relative scattering situation of the transmitter and of the receiver. Uh, it's relatively stable to the feedback delay for the specific uh, fixed wireless access channels that we look at. It's a different question when we look at the cellular environment. And uh, the, uh, a given receiver performs better in a time reverse channel. Now, what we're going to do next is 
look at time diversity in a cellular scenario and see how much uh, more we can, uh, how much better we can do in terms of cellular throughput instead of link throughput uh, by exploiting the fact that we also have spatial focusing and, just, and not just time focusing the time diversity. This is all I have to say, and I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Is there any fundamental reason why spatial focusing and time focusing has to be traded off from one another? Um, so is there some kind of uncertainty principle in here? In, in a way, this is what the results uh, show. They tend to depend on uh, different things. Uh, so the spatial focusing depends on the angular characteristics of uh, different tabs uh, and uh, the temporal focusing depends on uh, the relative phases of the tabs. Uh, so a very uh, phase coherent profile will not give you a good temporal focusing. But it would give me a very good spatial? No. 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 Not really. So, so any intuition why time reversal is just a good point on that trade-off? I guess what, what I don't have is what is the time reversal filter doing to the channel that gives you some of these properties that you have shown? Is there some intuition to this? Um, okay, so in general, time reversal uh, relates to what is known as random code CDMA and this is what what you're doing essentially we're using a random code that is the uh, the channel impulse response time reverse now uh, it uh, works uh, to a certain degree uh, because uh, it, it gives you uh, a reduction in delay spread when it, because it's the autocorrelation of uh, the channel impulse response and uh, when you have sufficient time with the side loads go down and, and it also you can kind of think of it as a uh, beam forming because you have a lot of antennas right and you're adjusting the weight <laughs> and the antennas so you have special thoughts now the good thing about time reversal is I think that it's, it's, it's really, really, really simple. So yes, you can do optimal uh, wide band beam forming, but it's a very complicated equation to solve. You can do uh, zero forcing, and, and that would bring your delay spread down to really, really small, but you lose a lot of power and you have all the bad effects that zero forcing comes, uh, comes with. Time reversal is, um, uh, what do you call it, a happy medium? Happy medium. Happy medium. Okay. And it, it's popular, I think, with hardware design. This is easy. You showed that if you go from 10 taps to 20 mm -hmm. taps, you don't gain that much because 10 taps is almost enough. Yeah. So that suggests that if you, re if you play the game of reducing the number of taps, of course, the performance will get worse for both cases, but the improvement of time reversal over non-time reversal will probably be more dramatic. In other words, you can get by with just a few taps with mm -hmm. time reversal, yeah. and you couldn't get away with a few taps yeah. without it. Yeah. So exactly. it might be interesting to see what the relative improvement is as a function of the number of taps. Yeah, so the complexity. Yeah, if you, you gain complexity, and performance degrades in both cases, but not as much for yeah. time reversal. Okay. Also, you didn't say much about the precision that you need in setting the filter taps in the transmitter using measurements from the receiver and feeding it back. I mean, that's a whole new issue, but have you thought much about that? Um, I haven't thought about it. Um, there, there have been some uh, theoretical results that relate the signal to noise ratio when you measure the channel so how much error you make in measuring the channel 
to the benefit that you gain in uh, time uh, when you use time diversion. This result, the, the way they are now, they talk about how much you lose in terms of special focus. And now we're doing them um, in terms of how much you lose in terms of uh, temporary focus. There are some other things that that university is good for. Uh, because you can do uh, 3D isolated communication to two users at the same time. Uh, you can um, you can have the benefit of multi-user behavior without doing dirty paper code effects. Really hard. You can have that. More questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris.